All righty. Good morning, everybody. I hope that you are doing well. Welcome to uh, our uh, virtual house church worship for this May the 31st, our day of Pentecost. Uh, I just want to share with you a few announcements uh, about what's going to be coming, uh, coming up in the next couple of weeks. Next Sunday, we will actually not be gathering in this format. We will be... Uh, having a joint worship service with Calvary Moravian, and it's going to be uh, an education-based uh, service, and so we're going to be uh, honoring our uh, our kids here and the ones at Calvary, and then it's going to be uh, just a focus on uh, the power and importance of education in our modern time. That will be done through Calvary's website, and I will, uh, once they create the link, uh, we'll send it to you via email. And um, all you'll have to do is just click the link and it'll take you directly to that worship service. Or you can go to your, um, the, their website, which we'll also send out in the email, and just click the, the live button and you can watch it that way. Our, uh, we will be having a board meeting this coming Monday night to talk about um, opening the building and um, after we have that conversation, we'll have a little bit better idea of what worship is going to look like the week after. So if you'll just be on the lookout for that, so that information. Uh, we will be continuing our Ecclesiastes Bible study, which will be um, Tuesday. It's Tuesdays at 7 p.m. If, um, if you want to be a part of that and don't have the link, you can uh, contact our Facebook administrator. Or you can contact me or the church office, and we can share that with you. Um, we are going to open this morning uh, in a time of prayer it's just uh and there are some requests that have been listed on the uh, group chat and i'll just share those now uh for jd brock who um is uh, it's my understanding that he's still in the hospital sort of re recovering um i haven't heard anything uh, other than that um, so i assume that's where he is at um for Ricky McMillan, that's Robin's uh, first cousin who uh, passed away of cancer. Uh, and then Eddie Weatherman, who is um, Bonnie Weatherman, or um, the husband of Bonnie Weatherman. Bonnie passed away um, in the past couple of days as well. And then from Anna, she, her cousin Bonnie in Houston, Texas, is, um, uh, is in the hospital with coronavirus. And um, uh, for, for, um, for, uh, yeah, and then um, for Leah um, right now, and also for uh, just the general state of where we are in the country and the world. So um, if you will just, uh, uh, you can, that's all on the prayer request list on the group chat. And you can, if you can, um, if you want to jot those down, uh, to pray through, pray for those throughout the week, um, or just use it now as sort of a reminder. Let's have an opening word of prayer. God, we ask that you continually fill our hearts. We ask that as we gather to proclaim you, that our words will be a true representation of how we feel. Lord, we give you thanks for the love that we have for you. We give you thanks for the love that you show to us. Lord, in the midst of uh, trying times, we ask that your peace and strength be with us. Lord, as we are uh, perhaps uh, understanding the depths and the extent of what uh, or how of how tr trying the times can be, we ask that we might find your peace and strength in uh, uh, ways perhaps that we haven't uh, we haven't expected. Lord, we ask that you calm our hearts. We ask that you uh, give us your spirit as a means of guidance. And Lord, we pray that you continue to seek us out no matter where we are in our lives. God, we give you thanks for this ability to gather and to proclaim you. And we pray that you continue to give us strength to endure as we eagerly await the time when we can gather together face to face and proclaim you in ways that feel uh, a little bit closer to normal. We pray that you give us courage to figure out um, when that's appropriate. And we pray that you give us wisdom to figure out uh, new ways to continue to reach out. God, we give you thanks for all that you have given us an ability to do. And we pray that we might put that on display as a means for proclaiming you out in the world. For it's in your son's holy name we pray. Amen. 
So it is the day of Pentecost, and I uh, want to um, read uh, the Pentecost text before we, uh, before uh, as as we open with our worship. So, uh, this is from Acts, the second chapter, verses uh, uh, 1 through 15. When the time for Pentecost was fulfilled, they were all in one place together. And suddenly, there came from the sky a noise like a strong driving wind, and it filled the entire house in which they were. Then there appeared to them tongues as of fire, which departed and came to rest on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in different tongues as the Spirit enabled them to proclaim. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven staying in Jerusalem. At this sound, they gathered in a large crowd, but they were confused because each one heard them speaking in his own language. They were astounded and in amazement, and they asked, Are not all these people who are speaking Galileans? And how does each uh, of us hear them in his own native language? We are Parthians, Medes, Elamites, inhabitants of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and the districts of Libya near Cyrene, as well as travelers from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, yet we hear them speaking in our own tongues of the mighty acts of God. They were all astounded and bewildered and said to one another, what does this mean? But others said, scoffing, they have had too much wine. And Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice and proclaimed to them, you who are Jews, indeed all of you staying in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to my words. These people are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. So what I want to do now is I want to have a, a time of responsive prayer. This is a, a prayer that has been adapted from the um, Moravian uh, Book of Worship. And this prayer is entitled Intercessions During Time, uh, a time of Crisis. And this has been adapted to uh, perhaps uh, fit where we are currently. So I invite you to join me uh, in praying this. God of mercy, God of comfort, we come before you in this time of difficulty, mindful of human frailty and need, confused and struggling to find meaning in the face of suffering. We are grateful that even as we share in the joy of Jesus Christ, we can also share abundantly in comfort in the midst of suffering. For victims of disease, for people torn apart by hatred and anger, for people who are public servants, who sacrifice some of the comforts of life for our safety and protection, for all who are in danger, trouble, or anguish, we ask the presence and strength of your spirit. Give all who suffer the love that bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. We ask that the power of love be poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Be the support of all who give their strength, their skill, and their stamina in a ministry of mercy. Open our hearts that we may be partners in their commitment to bring relief. Where tempers flare and a spirit of hate provokes new hostility, raise up people who have patience and restraint where crisis deepens and suffering goes without relief, awaken deliverers who have peace and strength. Take away the temptation to trust in human power and give us the courage to be your servants in the community. Direct all governments in the way of peace and justice that your will may be done among the nations. We pray for all of those who are suffering Help them to turn to the one who embraces us where we are in our lives and who lived and suffered among us. There is no one who is righteous, for we have all turned away from you. 
Make us aware of our need for you and remove from our hearts pride, malice, and greed. Have mercy on your whole creation. Help us to follow your commands and by grace make us worthy to stand before you. Amen. And as that um, as that prayer highlights all the awfulness and craziness and uncertainty that's going on in the world, uh, our opening hymn this morning perhaps uh, redirects our attention to something that's so very, very uh, beautiful. So I invite you to join me in singing uh, our opening hymn this morning, Peace, Perfect Peace. <laughs> scripture passage that we were actually supposed to use uh, two Sundays ago, uh, we are going to use this Sunday, and it actually fits pretty well into Pentecost, and I'll explain that in a little bit. So this is from Acts chapter 17, verses 22 through 31. Then Paul stood in front of the Aeropagus and said, Athenians, I see how extremely religious you are in every way. For as I went through the city and looked carefully at the objects of your worship, I found among them an altar with the inscription, To an unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you, the God who made the world and everything in it. He who is Lord of heaven and earth does not live in shrines made by human hands, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mortals life and breath and all things. From one ancestor he made all nations to inhabit the whole earth. He allotted the times of their existence and the boundaries of their places where they would live, so that they would search for God and perhaps grope for him and find him, though indeed he is not far from each of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as even some of your own poets have said, for we too are his offspring. Since we are God's offspring, we ought not to think that the deity is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of mortals. While God has overlooked the times of human ignorance, now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will have the world judged in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this, he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. And then the second passage is John 14, 13 through 21. This is Jesus speaking. I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If in my name you ask me for anything, I will do it. If you love me, you will keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to be with you forever. This is the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, because he abides with you, and he will be in you. I will not leave you orphaned. I am coming to you. 
In a little while, the world will no longer see me, but you will see me because I live. You also will live. On that day, you will know that I am in my Father and you in me and I in you. They who have my commandments and keep them are those who love me. And those who love me will be loved by my Father. And I will love them and reveal myself to them. Sarah, if you could unmute us all, please. Now, keep in mind that whenever she hits this unmute button, just pretend like you are up in front of the whole entire church and you are speaking directly into the microphone. So if you wouldn't say it directly into the microphone at church, don't say it now. Sarah, if you will please unmute us all. Sorry, hang on. They they changed things and it's not there where it was before. No worries. No worries. So what I'll go ahead and do is just sort of talk about um, a couple of things. Um, uh, the text that I'm going to be talking about really do go into the Pentecost, uh, this idea of Pentecost, whenever the Spirit comes down and enables the believers. And um, the, the John text, where Jesus says that I'm going to be with you and that those who love me will have my presence. Um, Pentecost is the fulfillment of that text. And then the Acts passage is an example of what somebody is able to do when enabled with the Spirit. And at the, in the Acts passage, um, it's interesting what Paul is doing. So I want to talk about that just a little bit. So Paul is in Athens. And Athens is this, you know, massive city. Uh, and it's thought of as high society. You know, it's the, um, uh, you know, the Athenians are thought of as great philosoph philosophers and smart people. And so um, it, it the, there's a quote in the ancient world where it says, intelligence lives in Athens. And so Paul is giving this speech to this group of very, very learned people. And not only learned people, but people who, you know, um, th this religion that Paul is proclaiming really don't have much understanding or care for. So Paul's going into maybe not a hostile audience, but just one where he has to explain it to them in a way that will have meaning. And um, what does he start talking about? He starts talking about these idols that he sees. And he says, y'all are actually really religious people. And he says uh, in, a, in a few passages earlier than the one that we're talking about, he says that Athens is chock full of um, chock full of idols and it's interesting that he has such a remark because um, he should sort of know where he is going he's going to a, a, a university town a center of logic um, an idea or a place where um, just religious uh, all sorts of religious ideas should be there so he he should know that and uh, it's sort of uh, and so his, his comment becomes sort of interesting because he should, like you say, you sort of wonder why he would say that. And um, maybe he expected them there, but just not so many. It's sort of like, have any of y'all ever been to Hershey, Pennsylvania? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, I know Jamie has. She, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, okay. The whole town smells like chocolate. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's great. You know, and I guess the first time I ever went to Hershey, I expected there to be chocolate stuff, but not just have an essence of chocolate just floating in the air you know the street lights um they, they are like you know uh hershey kiss shaped and um i'm not even i'm not a huge sweets fan but uh just being up there and just surrounded by chocolate is, is, is this all-encompassing sort of thing um but the other thing is that he might be more making a comment not that he's taken back by just the amount of idols but he's more taken back by the fact that the, the religious, the Jewish people who are there, the synagogue that is there, hasn't had much effect. 
you know, the, the thought would be um, when comparing uh, these religious practices of many people um, that aren't unified to one, uh, you know, to a religious faith that professes uh, belief in an all-powerful creator, that that would have some impact, but it really doesn't. And so that's where, that's the sort of background that Paul is going into. Um, and then he, he does this thing that can really only be described as spirit led. He starts, he, he starts to speak like an Athenian. And he starts off doing something that uh, Athenians do all the time, or people in logic base do all the time. He uses an observation. And he says that these Athenians are such religious people. Did anybody catch why he said that? He wants them to feel good. Um, no. I don't think so. <laughs> uh, there's something that he's, there, there's one observation that he makes about a particular religious altar. Did anybody catch that? The unknown God? Yes. <laughs> Paul starts off his very lofty speech by saying, you are so religious because you are so religious that you even have an altar to an unknown God. So our question would be, how is that religious? That just seems odd. That seems a-religious. That seems um, uh, heretical. Um, but for them, it's actually is that they were so aware of what they didn't know that they wanted to create a space for that thing to be there in the hopes that through worshiping it, um, you know, they, they, they would be good. They would be, there would be um, some, some benefit to it. So they know there's something that they don't know, but they know is there. And then Paul comes in and he says, well, guess what? I'm going to tell you everything about the one that you don't know because I know about it. And that is, that is, like, that, that is just a stroke of brilliance right there because he's not arguing against anything else that they already believe. He's just expanding their understanding of something that is already there. Um, uh, a side, side note, Moravian history side note, that's why the early Moravian missionaries had such success because they took this note from Paul and they didn't go in and try to tell everybody why their understanding of God was wrong. All they did was go in and just explain how Jesus fit into their religious beliefs and how Jesus was the most important thing to believe in. So it's, it's a very, very, uh, very smart tactic. And he says, um, you, you, everybody has within them this created nature to yearn after this thing, which you don't know, which I'm going to call, we're just going to call God. But the other very important thing that Paul says is he says that since we are God's offspring, and keep in mind, your poets have already written that, and you agree with me on that. Since we are God's offspring, we ought not to think that God is like these gold and silver idols um, that are formed by people. And, you know, I think that is something that we tend to forget. Um, even though we are so focused on God, and not like the Athenians, not like uh, uh, so focused on many gods, we're just focused on one God. Yet we still try to create physical representations. Uh, we do that... Um, with crosses, we do that with nativity scenes. Um, we sort we do that even with church, the outward church building. We see it on billboards, and we also see it not in big stuff, but in stuff that we can put in our houses, stuff that we can look at and hold that reminds us of God. And so uh, I started just looking around my office. So I have a little show and tell for you here. So this is within 20 feet of me every day. So I've got uh, a very, very lovely Love Feast candle that was made and wrapped uh, by the Women's Fellowship on a very, very lovely Moravian star stand. And, um, you know, we have all of our associations of uh, what this is. We have the red ribbon, which is to remind us of Jesus's blood, which uh, is a, has a protective quality to it, and the beeswax, which is pure because Jesus is pure, and the star, which guides uh, the uh, wise men to the babe. And then I've got this really cool, it's like a, I don't know what it is. It's like this crystal. 
yeah, it's crystal, but it's like there's something. In, it's like a, it's a love feast scene inside of the crystal, and I and there's a little star up there, and that's supposed to evoke uh, a reminder of the love feast and all the love feast is for. So I have that. Then uh, my best friend, when he went to Cuba, he uh, he brought me back this uh, rosary, and I've actually got a collection of every uh, every country that I've ever gone to that uh, is a majority of Catholicism. I have a collection of rosaries. Uh, this is just the one that was closest to me. And then Dick Sheik, who does scroll saw work, uh, which is a very intricate tool, uh, made me this, which is yeah. a very delicate cross that says the Lamb of God on it. And um, Peggy Riddle made this for me. Uh, it's a basket with a Moravian uh, lamb on the inside, uh, inside of it, on the bottom. And those are just the things that were within... 20 feet of me do y'all have any of this sort of stuff uh around your house mm -hmm. yes. what sort of stuff do, do y'all have i have crosses uh sharon, sharon you got some crosses what, what do you got sheila uh stars uh crosses candles um uh, different things <laughs> I've even got down in my woodworking shop, um, I've got a, um, a Greek cross and uh, a friend got me a, a picture of the Holy Trinity. So it's, it's stuff that we are, um, you know, we're, we're accustomed to having this stuff around. And I sort of wonder, why do we do that? Why? Do we, and I know this, this has a, this has an air of Zach's going to trash, you know, the cool stuff that we have in our house. I'm, I'm not trying to do that. Just trying to make a point. Um, why do we have these things? Why do we like to fill our lives with these things? What's the purpose of that? To remind us of our Christianity. Ah, okay. To remind us um, of, uh, and not just our, our Christianity, but perhaps our connection to others that we have uh, through yes. our faith. Why else might we try to fill our lives with these things which we create? An expression or witness. Ah, it's okay. A sign of God. Right. It's an ex it's an expression. It's a, a witness. And what were you saying, Sheila? Uh, it, it's a visible sign to us, particularly of God. I mean, uh, symbolic of our faith, of, of what we believe, and that we do believe in God. <laughs> yeah, it becomes a symbol of our identity. It becomes a symbol of belief. Um, and like Sharon said, it can be this, uh, you know, this, this, this outward expression that other people are going to see. And then they say, wow, tell me about that candle. Why does it look so funny? And then we say, well, let me tell you all about it. Um, <laughs> and I would, I, I would say that all of that stuff goes back to trying to reconnect to God, either How through sharing with other people, either through a reminder for us, um, and, or as even as Paul puts it, it becomes an attempt to grope out or to reach out and have a t like hold something uh, almost like a tangible nature of God. And, um, you know, these things that we have uh, really speak to this, we, this, this, nature, this nature that we have created in us that we need God. We have, a, um, we have a desire created within us for the divine. Perhaps it's, um, you know, it, perhaps that gets manifested in a couple of different ways, like um, strength and comfort. We need strength and comfort in the midst of, you know, all the different types of trying times that we have. Or we just want our life to calm down, and so there's peace there. And perhaps these things remind us of the promise of peace or strength and comfort. Um, but we could also say that we create those things so that the physical nature of them fills the void and it starts to get away. And again, I'm not trying to say that these are bad. I love these things. Um, I always am looking forward to finding new uh, crafty expressions of faith. And that's really cool. It's special that the simplest thing can um, give, uh, remind us of meaning. Then let's consider what does Jesus say, though? Not though, and. Um, we know that in John 14 that the disciples are going to struggle because there is this going to be this lack of presence. 
Jesus is telling the disciples over and over again, hey, guess what? Get ready, because I'm not going to be with you. And then what does Jesus say that he is going to give with them uh, or give them to be this thing that is going to fill the void of him physically not being there? What's the spirit of truth? Ah, the spirit, the spirit of truth, the spirit of God, the spirit that is going to fill you with a sense of love like Jesus, uh, like, like when Jesus is there, it's going to be this reminder, it's going to be this thing that uh, inspires you and reminds you of the words of God. Even whenever you are, even when you have nobody around you, even when you have nothing to remind you of me physically, I am still going to give you something else to fill that gap. And that's so stunning. That's such a special promise. You know, um, I think about whenever Jesus talks about um, things that moth or rust can destroy or things that thieves can break in and steal. I don't assume that any thief who breaks into the church office wants to abscond with my, uh, my Moravian candle. They could. They probably won't. But I do know that um, the color on it is starting to fade because I keep it in the window. Um, and, you know, there are other things that can happen. Uh, what Jesus is talking about is something that nothing can destroy. Nothing can uh, take it away. And so there does, there tends to be this, this disconnect with the way that we tend to like to be religious or the way that we like to tend to remember God in our life. Uh, there's a disconnect with that and this idea of the Holy Spirit being with us constantly. And so we can sort of ask the question, if the Holy Spirit is coming to be with us, why isn't that enough? If this presence of Jesus' love that is going to be with us, or is promised to be with us um, no matter what, why, is, why, why isn't that enough for us to have a sense of understanding of Jesus in our life? Why do we try to create things to remember, to remind, or to feel? If the unending spirit is promised, why isn't that enough? Any ideas? We want to witness. Okay. Perhaps it's, um, we want to witness so bad that maybe we don't necessarily trust our ability to do so. So maybe those things help us. Why else isn't it enough? for us just to have the promise of the Spirit. Well, being human, we tend to forget. Ah, okay. We tend to forget. Another way uh, is that maybe we don't actually have that never-ending, that sense of never-ending presence. Maybe we don't actually experience that. And, it, the re, and the reason that is, is that that promise, as beautiful as it is, is conditional. You know, so often uh, folks get on millennials for not liking conditions. And yeah, that's true. Um, and this is one of those conditions that I sort of just wish that we were just promised it was going to be there because, you know, we believe and cool. Uh, it, it's a little bit different than that. It's a little bit deeper than that. And the, the condition is that... There has to be something that's done on our part first. It's it's very much like the prodigal son. It's not like the prodigal son just keeps you know, just keeps uh, being able to, you know, live life in the fast lane, and then all of a sudden, uh, the love of his father is going to come airmail, and the fatted calf is going to be salted and sent to him, and um, then he can just open it up and eat and eat it while he is taking a break from all the fun stuff that he's doing. That's not the case. He actually has to come back first. There has to be that recognition within the product, within the son that he is living wrong and he needs to come back. Um, that's the sort of condition that we have here. And the condition that we have here is that you have to do what Jesus tells you to do. You have to do or you have to live in a way that Jesus wants you to live for that sense of, or that continual sense of the spirit to be with you. Uh, and 
anytime you know the question comes up okay cool well what's that look like i will always refer anybody and everybody to the most concise list of how jesus tells us how to live and that's the sermon on the mount that's matthew chapters five through seven um, that continual promise is predicated on us doing what he commands now we could say well i go to church i do all the stuff at church is that the same thing and does that seem is, is that really cutting it and you know for some that might be a thing um the simple act of gathering to worship might be something that is so fulfilling that that's a that, that's enough but for some of us it's it's really not because church um what church really is is should be just for two things worshiping and then helping interpret the commands and if though those aspects of church are not there that's perhaps when we start to get away from this sense of true presence because true presence is in the heart and it's um i don't mean to put anybody on the spot but uh sarah can you uh can you unmute eileen please Eileen, you don't have to answer this if you don't want to, but I would love for you to answer this. Okay. Okay. And I and this is y'all. This is not planned at all. Uh, so uh, <laughs> don't think that this is a plant. Eileen, can you speak just a little bit about the difference between sort of sitting and um, participating uh, just in the motions of church versus doing. Can you speak to that and if there's a difference and uh, if you feel a greater sense of presence in doing versus sort of just being? I'm thinking. Okay. <laughs> <Cool>. <laughs> Doing brings earthly blessings. Um, if I come to church and I just sit there, or if I go anywhere and sit and listen, listening is good. However, doing has its own blessings, and those are used to glorify God. It's faith in action. Can you perhaps speak to a sense of how you feel whenever you are uh, doing family, or, you know, um, organizing family promise do you feel a you know a sense of presence of spirit um do you feel something in your heart whenever you're doing that in a nutshell i give it to god and he causes or speaks to others through the holy spirit and they too receive a blessing how does how does that make you feel whenever um, whenever you're a part of that? Blessed beyond measure, I, I find no words. It touches the heart in a special way, and that's thank you, Eileen. I, you're welcome. I don't mean to put you on I the spot. Hope, I hope that the message came across yes ma'am it did and that's that's where the true presence of jesus is it's in the heart and it's um that really gets to what paul is saying to the athenians is that um it's not just in some things that we can create for reminders um those things are great those things are fantastic so long as they don't become the actual focus of our belief so long as we believe that there is not real power just in them, but um, they're in what inspires those creations. 
as long as they remind us and inspire us of Jesus's promise of the spirit and the promise that uh, through doing what Jesus tells us to do, that the spirit will be there. Those things are great and they are so very, very special. It's interesting to think about what a, a simple little thing can remind us of. You know, I'm sitting here thinking about um, thinking about love feasts uh, because that's that is such a that's such a spectacle for us, and it's 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 very much meant to be something that is meaningful to the community. And there's so much that we can explain about it. Um, and then there's all sorts of stuff that can go wrong on love feast. <laughs> Sarah will tell you that. Uh, Really, anybody who's ever seen me in the back uh, on Christmas Eve tells you that I'm a nervous wreck. Like I'm pacing back and forth. I'm, you know, I've got all my notes jotted down on um, on my piece of paper, and uh, it's all because uh, I have this inherent fear that something is going to mess up. Or like the first time that we ever uh, decided to make carts, uh, I was told that I was just sitting there, just staring at the at the carts as they rolled out, and I just had it in my mind that all the coffee was just going to fall through each level and love piece was going to be ruined. We're going to have to cancel Christmas and uh, it was going to be horrible. Um, and I think that, you know, the thinking like that gets away from the true, you know, true essence of what's there and what, um, what the spirit can actually do. Um, it was funny, you know, a year after that's so whenever a dishwasher broke. Can't have a love feast if you can't wash the cups. But at the same time, we were able to, uh, we were able to get through it and focus on that, which actually binds us together and have a beautiful experience. Um, I think we have all sorts of places in our lives that um, we like to look to to find things that uh, remind us. Um, but they can't be just that. The reminders can't take on the um, can't take on our focus and devotion. Um, like for the for the love feast example, I really need to be more focused on the love that inspires us to come together and trust that everything is going to fall in place. Um, so yeah, uh, I think our final hymn today encapsulates that which I've been trying to uh, express to you. So uh, I want to invite you to join me in singing. So our final hymn this morning is Holy Spirit, Lord of Love. And as we sing this, let us just be reminded of the power that is there in the Spirit and let us take inspiration from all that we like to fill our lives with. So as you 
go out and as you seek to be inspired by all that is around us and truly be guided by the Spirit, uh, I hope that you are inspired to live into the con uh, to the promises of the condition that when we do what Jesus tells us to do, the promise or the Spirit will always be with us. And the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and to be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace, which in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. I hope that y'all have a lovely rest of your day and uh, just uh, be on the lookout for what's going to be going on in worship in the next couple of weeks. And I hope that, like I say, you have... Uh, I haven't destroyed all of the sense of uh, the importance of beautiful religious things in our houses, and I hope that you uh, are doing well and continue to do well. And I'll talk to you later. Y'all have a good rest of your day.